everyone. This is Laurel Pickering, President and CEO of Northeast Business Group on Health. I want to welcome you to our webinar on reducing hospital readmissions through stakeholder collaboration. And this is a report about our project um, in our Solutions Center at the Business Group. And you're going to hear more about the Solutions Center in a minute. Um, but this is a great example of what you know, I think the business group is most uh, known for and the value that we really bring to our members and to the market as a whole. Um, it's a multi-stakeholder um, look at hospital readmissions and what we can all do what we're all better doing together than we are alone. And that was really the findings of our work around readmissions. We're doing, many of us are doing so much in our own organizations to reduce readmissions um, successfully, but collaboration can actually bring reduction to the next level, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So we are fortunate to have with us Jeremy Nobel, who is our medical director, and the, I'm sorry, I have to get with changing the slides. Okay. Okay, there we go. <laughs> sorry about that, everyone. So we are going to be joined today by, I'll go back to the agenda in a minute, um, by Jeremy Nobel, who is the executive director of the Solutions Center in addition to the medical director at the business group. Um, Michelle Martin, who is on our board of directors, who I know many of you know because she's a very active member of the business group. She's the vice president of HR specialty services at CBS. And before I go into the agenda, I want to take a moment, as I always do before a business group program, to highlight upcoming events. And the one that I want to highlight on this webinar is our annual conference, which is coming up on May 14th. And um, hopefully you've all gone ahead and registered. I think the early bird rate ends Friday. Um, and a reminder to the employers on the line that you get a one complimentary admission. And the theme of the conference is really focused on employers' benefit strategies going forward in light of health reform, the Cadillac tax, and all of the um, issues that are facing them around delivering cost-effective health care benefits to employees. Uh, again, it's May 14th, and I hope that you all will join us. Um, I do want to thank our sponsors of the readmissions work that we've been doing, um, Beringer Ingelheim, AstraZeneca, and Novo Nordisk. And I think as you know, we always say, and as you all know, we couldn't do the important work that we do without the support of sponsors because we are a nonprofit organization. So thank you so much to those organizations for supporting us. So in terms of the agenda, um, we're going to do some stage setting. I think most of you know who the business group is and, and the Solutions Center, but we'll review that. We'll give the obligatory overview of avoidable hospital readmissions and how much they impact all of us and how much they cost. And then what we identified in this process was what we think is a new opportunity for health plan and health system collaboration around readmissions. And that is really the uh, crux of the work that we did here. And we're going to tell you where, at the end where this has led to, which is very exciting. Um, we'll talk, this is all Jeremy's, a lot of Jeremy's uh, presentation. He's going to talk about the critical requirements for effective health plan and health system collaboration, and then I'll do the kind of where do we go from here and what's happened since we, we closed this work. Um, I think with that, I will, um, oh, questions. So we are not going to be able to take questions throughout um, because we want to get through the content, but we think that we will have enough time at the end both to take, you know, open the lines for questions, but I also want to encourage you, you have a questions box on your webinar screen that you can uh, type in questions um, during the webinar there. I will actually be monitoring them, and if I think that there's a quick question that we can ask that's relevant at that point in time, I'll be happy to try to fit that in. So I will be looking at those questions throughout. 
So, actually, I am now going to not turn it over to Jeremy, but turn it over to Michelle, who is going to walk you all through the Northeast Business Group on Health and the introduction of the webinar. Michelle? Thanks, Laurel. Um, and so I, I started thinking back. I guess I've been involved with the business group probably, it's, it's about 10 years now. Um, on the board for, for most of that, and um, also have worked on the hospital readmissions project for quite a while. Um, so thanks for um, inviting me to participate in this webcast. A little bit about the Northeast Business Group on Health. We represent employers in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. But what you'll see on the next slide, most of uh, our majority, a lot <laughs> of our uh, employers are large national employers. Um, so you can see that although it, it's a, a regional focus here, we cover employees all across the United States and many global employers also. Um, this is an employer-driven uh, coalition, but that also, even though it's driven by the employers, we have members who are insurers, providers, suppliers, consultants, and other stakeholders. Um, we influence healthcare and the health insurance um, available to 10 million plus working Americans. And um, one of the huge benefits, I think, of the Northeast Business Group, Group on Health is speaking with one voice, and that is about quality, accountability, and value. Um, we are a member of the National Business Coalition on Health in Washington, D.C., and recognized as one of the country's most influential business coalitions. And uh, that has been at the direction of Laurel and uh, getting our name up there, so thank you. Um, we had uh, given a quick overview of the uh, uh, companies that are members. And the NEBGH focuses on education and training. I know for our company here it's great when we have uh, our staff getting involved and new people come on board. Um, getting involved in the Northeast Business Group on Health is just motivating for them. And, and I see a difference, um, and it keeps me motivated, I think, uh, ongoing. Um, we focus on quality and value improvement, and some of those programs include Evaluate, uh, Plan Evaluations. If you haven't attended those, those I think, Laura, those come up soon, right? Yes, they do. They're going to be in June, and we're meeting with Aetna, Cigna, United, Anthem, and CDHP, CDPHP in the Albany region. Oh, great. Yeah, if you haven't sat in on those, uh, I just it, it's a wonderful opportunity to be in uh, this room with other employers and the health plans um, and taking a real deep dive into their programs. Um, we also uh, are involved with LeapFrog, who does the uh, hospital safety. And if you haven't seen it yet, the uh, safety score, I think it's safetyscore.org, um, rates the hospitals on the letter grades, um, and it's, it's just very interesting. Um, so especially, you know, check that out for New York. Yeah, um, it's hospital, uh, Michelle, it's hospitalsafetyscore.org. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then uh, with uh, physicians, we work on a depression um, primary care pilot program. And that, again, I think is one of the great successes we had in working with the health plans and the physicians um, to get some things off the ground. And then, of course, healthcare policy. We try to educate the employers on what they need to think about as legislation changes. Um, not that much has changed in the last year or two or three. Um, I can't hear everybody laughing, but I'm sure you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy to tell us about the Solution Center. Thanks, Michelle. So um, I'm Jeremy Nobel. I'm the medical director at the Northeast Business Group on Health, and I uh, um, am the executive director of the Solutions Center here. Uh, I also am on the faculty at the Harvard School of Public Health, and I was delighted three years ago to be able to come to the Northeast Business Group on Health and really work with Laurel staff and the board to um, uh, invent the Solutions Center. <clears throat> and, the, and the real opportunity that caught my attention and that I think makes the Solution Center uh, unique in what's out there in the, both the policy and the marketplace landscape in healthcare is it's an opportunity to really focus on 
very practical um, approaches to some of the tough problems in healthcare. Um, you know, our mission is to you know identify uh, new and innovative ways to approach those problems, and then uh, disseminate that, uh, that those insights. Uh, leading towards um, interventions that meet certain really important characteristics, so-called move-the-needle characteristics, which means not just a nice pilot and um, everyone feels good for a while, but something that can significantly move the needle uh, in healthcare in a way that is generalizable and sustainable. And I, you know, I think the topic of today's webinar, webinar represents a really great um, uh, you know, opportunity to kind of talk about uh, some of those solution center methodologies that lead to the ability to generate um, important results. And so what I, I'll, I won't go through this at a uh, deep dive level, but what we've been able to develop over the last few years is a really um, robust framework for taking on complicated uh, um, challenges in healthcare and approach them in a systematic way. So, of course, the literature reviews, the interviews, the knowledge synthesis, but then at the heart of it is really the facilitated convenings of multiple stakeholders in healthcare, um, which is a particularly important um, activity right now, I think, with the rapid pace of change, so that stakeholders can share directly and to and with each other um, what they think is possible and then also what they see as obstacles, challenges, and uh, other impediments to progress. And so that early stage brainstorming activity leads to a, a kind of phase two expansion where we dig down more deeply into the clinical processes, the sustainable business models, and the employee communication requirements um, that need to underpin meaningful and sustainable change. And then phase three, that we are right on the brink of, as Laurel said, very exciting for readmission reduction, um, which is to actually move this work into some appropriate demonstration projects. So let me give a quick overview of the HRRP project. I think most people on this call probably know that uh, preventable hospital readmissions are a major issue. They occur far too frequently and place vulnerable patients in dangerous situations. Um, underpinning um, some of this are um, preventable um, aspects, and um, I think that, that sets the stage nicely. I'm going to move it over to Michelle. Um, who's actually going to dig some of this, dig into some of these topics, and explain the relevance of it from an employer perspective? So, Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so, you know, as, as Jeremy was saying, it's such a, a big issue, and I think that's why everyone is on the call today. Um, it, it occurs far too frequently, and the gaps in coordination. I think one of the major issues we found in in the readmission um, issues that we see. So examples of someone going from a hospital setting to um, a nursing home or rehabilitation center, um, you know, those uh, transitions have to go smoother. And um, then also the patient and caregiver information um, and confusion. So your caregivers, you're, they're working through these transitions, and then they're caring for you also at home. And things like medications, I know one that we hear of a lot, um, is they're prescribed, you're, you're leaving one of these hospitals or centers with a list of prescriptions, and you go, you get there, but then they get home, and they haven't lived with the person. They go through the medicine cabinet, they pull out all the prescriptions, and say, hey, these are, you know, I see you have to take this every day, and then you have these new prescriptions, not realizing some of them are duplicating or some they shouldn't be taking anymore. Um, so that confusion is just a, a huge issue. And then the uh, work done by the NEBGH Solution Center um, highlights collaboration among the health plans, health systems, and employers. Um, and what you're going to see here, the list of participants, and this is one thing I found fascinating when I um, participate in these, uh, um, this project and, and attended the meetings for the hospital uh, readmission reduction. You look, you had health plans, you had like all or many of the hospitals in our region there, and sharing information. So is where a lot of these companies may be competing uh, in other areas. Having them there and sharing what they're doing and knowing that you have that commitment from the hospital community and the uh, caregiving community in um, this area w was just amazing. And everybody just wanted things to work and wanted to do better. So um, one of the, I think, great reasons we're having such success with this is that there's, it's really bringing collaboration among all the different stakeholders. 
the cost of hospital readmissions. So $25 billion a year. Um, and then just in uh, New York State and just for private payers, you're looking at $568 million. Um, and this uh, then if you look at what comes from the uh, readmissions between the private sector, the public sector, um, and it's, it's just a problem that the system is misaligned. It's fragmented, uncoordinated, and fails to deliver value. Okay, the key findings, Jeremy, is this where I turn it to you? Uh, Jeremy, I think this is yours. Maybe that might not be. <laughs> so I'll keep going. Okay. No, no, I'm sorry, Michelle. Um, I'll, I'll take mute. it up from here. We were on mute. So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I guess this is the kind of uh, fragmented coordination problems hospitals have when they try to keep patients from coming back. So, um, uh, but seriously, you know, building on what Michelle said, one of the things that was quite remarkable about the process was the range of participants in multiple work stream meetings. And, I think having that uh, variety of perspectives is actually what really allowed us to make what I, what I believe are truly uh, some breakthrough observations about what, gets, wh what, what can be addressed around um, readmission reduction. And one of the key findings <clears throat> was that all the health systems and all the health plans were very aware of readmission reduction opportunities. And in fact, they were all hard at work reducing readmissions. And in fact, they were so hard at work doing it that often there were overlapping um, activities where a patient could get called two days after hospital discharge, not just by the health system, not just by the health plan, but maybe by the disease management um, service company that one of our members had. And, you know, at the very uh, least, that's inefficient, um, and, but even more worrisome, it's lack uh, of having a sense of coordination from the patient's perspective, wondering who's in charge. So, you know, we, we kind of imagined a rethinking of the process where um, stakeholder collaboration, and we'll talk more about what that means, was absolutely at the center of what whatever it was we wanted to imagine would be, um, you know, hospital readmission reduction 2.0, the next phase. So we thought we would start by looking at the addressable factors. And almost always the activity is focused on the clinical factors, and those are critical. Um, I think that's where a lot of the, the literature has focused, medication management, wound care, um, infection management, the things that really need to be done with a high level of clinical precision and excellence in order to prevent readmission. Um, there's no question that's fundamental. What came out very clearly in the, in the uh, convening and workflow activities were two other things, though. One is the importance of, um, of really individual patient characteristics. Um, whatever we imagine as care paths, it's not one size fits all. Huge variation in the amount of resources available to different patients at home, their healthcare literacy, um, their ability to cope and manage various aspects of stress that happen on the discharge process. So we needed uh, to be sensitive to that variation to detect it and then to be able to support patients at every step along with the way. And finally, recognizing that um, a big part of successful readmission reduction is logistic. If the patient needs oxygen at home uh, immediately after discharge or a home care visit, how do we make sure that that happens? And so that delivery of supplies, coordination of care, and so on was critical. And so we, we began to see the complexity, but the opportunity also of building a, a more collaborative care model. Um, and then it also, in parallel, became very clear that many of the activities we imagined were essential would require new people, new workflow, new processes, and that to make it financially and economically sustainable on the health system side, we had to imagine a payment reform model that would be able to um, meet the new economic requirements of care process improvement with the hopeful return on, on, um, on uh, benefit of the uh, reduced readmissions. So we moved towards a, a visualization of joint accountability. And so um, 
this, this is where I think employers have a tremendous opportunity, which is to really encourage the health plans and the health systems to move towards collaborative activity, not something uh, that in many settings is comfortable or familiar to the plans uh, and the health systems, but to imagine not only a collaborative path, but a payment model that rewards um, the accountability. And so we felt it was clear that we needed to establish a joint accountability environment where the quality and cost issues could be addressed in a collaborative way, but then look at specific assets that came from all stakeholders, including the employer, to avoid duplication effort and to have a greater likelihood of success. So what are the essential um, success factors? So this is all played out in the, uh, the full report, but we thought we would hit the highlights here. So three requirements. One is that there be collaboration in clinical outreach and care. So health plans and health systems have different clinical assets. And we go into it in quite a bit of detail in the report, so I won't duplicate all that here, but an obvious and easy to imagine um, reality is that a health plan actually has data on visits and encounters that a patient has across all hospital systems through uh, claim data uh, flow. And so the health plan is in a position in a way that no hospital um, is to fully understand the 360 degree uh, viewpoint of a patient's encounter with a range of healthcare systems. Um, so that's what the health plans might offer, for instance, that are unique and different in clinical care. Um, while what does the health system offer? Well, one-on-one, -on -one deep integration of clinical knowledge in the actual face-to-face -face care of, pro of uh, patients. And so you begin to see that wouldn't it be great if we can actually take the best of what a health system has, predictive modeling, advanced analytics, centralized care services, and blend those with what the best of what a health system uh, has, which is deep clinical knowledge, uh, committed healthcare prof professionals at the front line, the ability to engage and talk to patients and families real time, uh, face to face. And so that began to emerge as a clinical, um, achievable clinical uh, model. But then we began to imagine what else is required, and it comes back to the other requirement of business sustainability which is um, the recognition that the invention of new um, strategies for managing care might include and involve um, new uh, personnel, new systems, all of which require upfront financing. And while we might imagine a delay in the return, that return had to happen so that there was business sustainability long term. So we spent quite a bit of time mapping out elements of that model. And then finally, and this is very exciting to our employer members of, of the group, um, whether employee engagement and communication could be made part of the program, um, particularly for elective schedulable hospital admissions, where there's plenty of time for an employee uh, and their family to prepare for the hospital admission, and then also to make sure that the home environment is best prepared for what happens when that patient returns. So, those three success factors, uh, collaboration in the clinical outreach and care, business sustainability, and a, a deep commitment to employee engagement and communication. <clears throat> so I talked about the, the high level of collaboration in clinical care. I'm not going to, again, recite all of the um, elements that are fully laid out in our report, but just to give you a sense of it, you can't really um, manage readmission risk without recognizing that some patients are at greater risk of readmission than others. And this key process of risk identification and stratification is fundamental. And this is really where there's huge opportunities for collaboration between the health systems and the plans because they have access to different elements of clinical data. I mentioned the range of data that the health plan has through its claims. The health system has deep clinical data through the electronic health record uh, ability to capture medications um, and clinical details that really can give insight into risk. Then bringing together that risk identification, the development of a coordinated care model to understand what care could be delivered, uh, say, from a health plan, case management, centralized ability, um, nurses on the phone, if you will, and then what can be done uh, in the home, what can be done in the office, and so on. And then the final critical building block, uh, measurement, 
what are the program process and outcome variables that have to be um, identified, tracked, and made part of an ongoing uh, process improvement, which obviously can tie to payment. So, um, you know, I talked a little bit about the blending and the, um, the various capabilities that the health systems um, have, and uh, I won't go into detail again except to emphasize the last point on this slide, um, that we were very impressed by how, many act how much activity was already going on uh, on both the health plan and the health system side and the opportunity for uh, collaboration. The business sustainability requirement, again, to dig in a little bit more, I mean, you can imagine this has a, the full attention of our members who pay the bill. Uh, who will pay? Um, are resources being best deployed? Um, uh, obviously, incentives are attractive, but how much and to whom? And ultimately, is there really a return on investment, or are we just looking at more cost, um, well intended perhaps, but still not delivering uh, what we want? So. Um, some of the building blocks to that begins with uh, defining and establishing a clear vision about what success looks like. And for all the collaborators, because this is only going to work as collaboration if everyone feels they get what they need out of it, um, at the heart of it, obviously, is building block B, the contract. Um, that is, in many ways, the, uh, the ultimate control lever that guides a lot of downstream both thinking and action. Um, uh, we're well aware of that as employer purchasers, and so um, you know we we use that approach uh, to guide um, you know the system towards higher value care. Um, but um, there's a lot that needs to be done before you actually put a contract in place that's long-term sustainable. And then finally, recognizing that perfection is the enemy of the good, to not wait until we have the perfect contract and so on, but to go forward. And then. Um, Lastly, uh, um, sorry, I'm going to skip over that one in the interest of time. And lastly, requirement three, employee communication and outreach. So um, employers do this every day. They have multiple channels for reaching out and engaging employees, um, educate them, support them. Um, particularly for schedulable um, admissions. There's significant opportunity there. And I think it's also important um, to note that rewards and incentives can play a role here also. For instance, one of the things that came up was, gee, why don't we create a, um, a skill building online tutorial for our employees? And if they do that um, online session before a scheduled hospital admission and they get a passing score, it qualifies them for some amount of discount on the hospital copay. Obviously, a cost to our members because they step in and pay that, um, but hopefully a significant return on that investment in terms of having an educated and engaged employee downstream. So those are the three um, requirements. And you know, I think it, they make sense. They kind of map to what's going on in healthcare clinical transformation uh, more broadly. I think that um, part of what we're doing on the commercial side here with uh, employer purchaser driven uh, innovation is try to mirror some of the uh, important efforts in the, uh, the federal purchasing sector driven by the Affordable Care Act um, and Medicare and Medicaid purchases. And in many ways, if you actually look at the first two requirements, process coordination and contracts, that very much does mirror what's going on in the public purchasing sector. What's very interesting, and I think a, uh, almost the secret sauce, if you will, of what might be available to em employers, is something that Medicare and Medicaid can imagine, they can think about, they can plan, they can dream, but it, there is no um, easy way for public purchasers to be as in touch with the beneficiaries uh, that they provide contracts for as it is for our members to be in touch with employees. So uh, in terms of um, enthusiasm and excitement among the employers, I think this last category captured a significant amount of attention because it was so obviously actionable from the employer perspective. So those were our findings. And then um, what did it lead to in terms of a framework uh, for going forward? So. Here's a simple model of what that framework looks like, and some of the elements of that model 
are probably familiar from what I've said and certainly to the people who read the report and hopefully to the people who participated in all the workflows. And there are five elements. So um, the ability to have um, data sharing across different organizations, uh, very easy to say, hard to do, um, but that's a fundamental requirement. Uh, a collaborative care map, so what gets done by centralized care services, what gets done by practices, what gets done at discharge planning, um, and so on. Um, new rules and new roles, so what, who does what, who hands responsibility for a call to a patient um, over to who and on what milestone basis. Um, so that's, uh, that grid of activity needs to be further defined and put in place. Uh, the fourth element, sustainable business models. I talk quite a bit about that and um, obviously uh, fundamental to success. And then finally, uh, what employers really uniquely bring compared to Medicare and Medicaid, which is proactive patient engagement um, coming at uh, um, from multiple directions, um, leveraging a lot of communication channels available to the um, employer as well as benefit designs. So we left with, um, you know, a great framework, but also some questions. So what are the indicators for success if we would go forward and try to do this? What will the obstacles be? How would we measure pro uh, progress? And then who needs to be engaged? And the overwhelming conclusion of phase two, and the, uh, we were delighted by the support from several major health systems in the New York metro area, as well as by all the plans that were involved, is it's time for some pilots. And it's time to really take this framework and really better understand what's required um, for true care coordination, true cross-data sharing, what the contracts need to look like, what the uh, employee engagement needs to look like, and begin the process of moving from, from theory to practice, knowing that um, we won't let perfection be the enemy of the good, um, and that we're going to get running on a crawl, walk, run basis and use these demo projects to um, create a map forward. So that, that's kind of how things um, very nicely concluded at the fa this phase. And so we're very much into phase three of, of trying to better define those pilots. And um, uh, at some point we can talk more about that, but I wanted um, just to draw the, the, uh, the presentation part of this to a close and then maybe open this up We've kept a significant amount of time here to um, give the audience a chance to ask questions. I imagine part of what we've described here is very relevant and timely for many people in the audience. And I'd urge you to uh, send your questions over. You can uh, type them into the question box and uh, I'll turn it over to Laurel to coordinate the Q&A um, process. So um, thanks and we'll move it over to Laurel. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. And before, I'm actually going to flip these bullets for a second and just let you know about the next steps. Um, based on what Jeremy just said, we actually have a meeting with a major health system in, in New York City and Manhattan and five payers, five health plans coming up in uh, May. So we are starting the process of exploring what does you know, a multi-payer collaborative project look like around reducing hospital <coughs> admission. So we're very excited um, about that coming up. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that have been submitted and I'm going to go ahead and, and read those, but I'd also like um, the operator to open up the lines um, after that so that people can informally ask questions. So the first question is, what patient-facing technologies do you see as a good fit to support clinical collaboration for improved care? And that's actually one of Jeremy's sweet spots. So, Jeremy, <laughs> anything that you see on the horizon? Yeah, well, it, you know, that question of what, what, what can we do to better support patients really opens the door to look at some of the emerging technologies, so-called digital support technologies, um, that can be useful to patients. Um, as Laurel mentioned, it's an active area of research for me, having published early studies on the use of a digital scale in the home to reduce hospital readmissions for heart failure. We reduce those rates by 50% uh, with a control group. So there's no question that everything from digital scales to maybe even text messages to monitoring of various things have their role. 
Um, we anticipate working closely with those new um, digital health driven opportunities when we do that first requirement of looking at new clinical care models and programs. I think um, there's no question that these technologies have to be part of our view of the future of how we coordinate care, particularly in situations like uh, transitions of care and reducing readmissions because they, be, they, they offer very important technologies for engaging, activating, and connecting with patients uh, while they're in the home, while they're managing um, their own health decisions, which obviously, uh, you know, is more of a 24 by 7 activity than just the time you're on the phone with a care manager. So um, to sum up that question, there's no question there will, there will be uh, more use of digital technologies going forward, and we very much anticipate exploration of those uh, very specific um, leverage points, if you will, into the new care models that we include as part of the pilots. Great, thank you. So um, we have a few questions that have been typed in, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and ask them. Um, are there any of the organizations that we worked with um, that are CCTP sites, which is the Community-Based Care Transitions Program that CMS um, has as part of the ACA? Um, and I'm not sure if we know that. I'm guessing possibly. Do you know, Jeremy? I, I don't know explicitly, but <laughs> I refer whoever the questioner was to the 62 organizations <laughs> that are in the slide, uh, which does identify all the health systems, and it should be an easy reference point back. Yes. Will readmissions be all cause or diagnosis specific? That'll a, a great question. Will the readmissions be all cause or diagnosis specific? Um, um, you know, as I said, we won't let uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good. Some of these readmission categories are probably easier to go after than others. Um, we'll let that be in many ways up to the um, design part of the pilot for the stakeholders to decide whether it's a, a, a full-on all diagnoses uh, or whether it's a limited uh, subset of those. Um, and I just have been alerted by the chairperson that we actually, in this format, we can't open the lines for questions, so um, I'm <laughs> going to have to ask you to keep typing them in, so I apologize for that. When we run these at the business group, we often try to open the lines. Um, so it's a little bit different format. So. Will our risk adjustment take into account social barriers? You know, I'm going to pass this to Jeremy, obviously, but I think a lot of this is going to be worked out when we actually sit down to work with a group of health plans and a specific health system about how we would measure this. But Yeah, there, uh, yeah um, again, I'm not sure whether it's risk adjustment from the contract side or risk prediction from the identified people at risk. But in both those cases, there's no question that the social barriers play an enormous uh, role, and we'll do everything we can to uh, include them in both aspects of patient assessment. Okay. Um, what are our specific measures of ROI? And, you know, I would ask certainly Jeremy to respond, but Michelle, I know that there are, you know, things that employers are looking to in terms of, you know, outcomes from readmission reduction programs, clearly a reduction in readmissions, but is there anything that you want to add about what you would be looking at as an employer from a, you know, readmission reduction program? Well, you know, I think one of the focuses we have here is on um, the caregiver and sort of the, the stress on the caregiver. So, I mean, certainly we want to see readmission uh, errors go down and, and um, you know, the, the quality of health improve. But I think when you start to coordinate and educate the caregiver, that and the caregivers are our employees in many cases. Um, so it just helps them, I think, um, it kind of reduces the stress on the caregiver if we can educate them more and um, make sure that that care is coordinated um, with as little of their help as needed and, and keeping the caregiver in the loop. So that's one of the things I would like to see. Jeremy, other measures of ROI? 
Um, definitely, but I wanted to build on what Michelle said first. I mean, I, I, I made a little bit of a point of it about why the work we're doing on readmission reduction is different than what Medicare and Medicaid is doing. And one of the critical differences is the emphasis on productivity as a value proposition uh, for the employer purchaser. And Michelle touched on it. You know, if your spouse or your child is in the hospital and then comes home, that is an enormous um, burden and challenge to the entire family. And um, yes, some part of it, if that person hospitalized is your employee, is when they can actually um, return to work. Um, but even if it's the spouse or the uh, child of the employee, also covered under your benefits plan typically, of course, um, there is a, uh, a cost, really, in terms of the distraction of that, that employee at their daily job is they're worried about you know, the person they're trying to take care of at home. So I very much think we have to get um, more creative going forward in assessing some of the real um, value that gets generated in more thoughtful readmission reduction programs. So I wanted to add that to what people usually think of. I mean, the other, the other uh, ROI calculations are more typical um, categories of resource requirement in and uh, cost reduction out. Uh, hospitalization is very expensive. Emergency room visits very expensive. Any reduction in those downstream costs obviously are part of what justify the investment in better car care processes up front. Great. Um, Again, another technology question. I mean, I think that um, you know where we are with technology um, today really opens up wide ways to better and more efficiently um, do all sorts of things in, in healthcare. And this question specifically is, what are your thoughts about technology increasing communications between the care teams? I mean, I think it's essential. Um, Jeremy? Well, I, I do too. And, you know, I didn't, when I talked about my, my um, discussion of technology before, I focused on some of the digital health and sensing and remote monitoring and telehealth technologies. Um, this question actually kind of points towards another very important set of technologies of what you might call care coordination and workflow technologies. And um, there are many things that are now emerging in the technology arena that allow multiple people, including the patient, including the, the caregiver, to be active collaborators in their own care with the ability to push out to each of the participants a daily checklist um, a set of guidelines and questions. How are you doing today, Mrs. Garcia? Have you taken your medicines today? Do you know whether um, uh, your wound is a problem uh, today in terms of infection and so forth? And it's just remarkable what we can do now. I mean, in the same way we use Facebook to coordinate people with groups, we can use something similar, more secure, um, to have a little collaborative group around keeping Mary Garcia out of the hospital. And I think it's an untested but very attractive way to put these new technologies to work. Great. So the next question is one that I think we're all struggling with, whether an employer, a health plan, a hospital, is, is around health literacy. And um, so the question is, in regarding health literacy, what are the programs that we're thinking of to put in place for the provider side to assist them in communicating you know, easily understood discharge and follow-up information to the patients? And I mean, this is probably one of the most critical aspects of success in reducing readmissions is you know, whether a patient understands what happens next when they leave. And, you know, I'm thinking that in this process we, you know, are going to certainly look at what the health system is currently using, what do the health plans have, and come to some, you know, agreeable, uh, and, and look at, you know, what is best in class for patients. Um, I don't think we've set that yet, but Jeremy, do you have anything you want to add on health literacy? Yeah, you know, um, health literacy is a huge national public health problem. You know, that's probably a global problem. I think it actually is um, a very appropriate thing to, to think about in the setting of readmission because you don't have a readmission unless you have an admission to a hospital. And, you know, anyone in the educational world understands there are um, opportunities where a, a student, if you will, <laughs> has a greater sense of attention, uh, a perceived need to know information 
uh, and knowledge about their condition. And I would argue um, that the hospital scenario is a unique and important time to focus on knowledge transfer um, to patients and caregivers. And I think there could be enormous benefits uh, to that. So if you look at the conditions that create the most number of readmissions, you know, there are cardiovascular conditions, there are metabolic conditions like di diabetes, and there's respiratory conditions like COPD. Every one of those conditions requires that the patient understand and make daily choices and decisions, and not just about one thing, but a lot of things. Medication, do I take it or not? Do I take it the right way? Diet and exercise, do I move more, eat less? And we've got to get further along on the health literacy front of not just giving people pamphlets, but really engaging them in being active participants in their own care. And so I think there's nothing like um, you know, a hospital admission to get your attention, um, and I think it's an enormous opportunity to address the health literacy crisis we have and bring patients up to speed with the knowledge they need. So, um I'm going to take these two questions together. Um, you know, one is, are you looking at using existing information from the Care Transitions Program around interventions and identification of high-risk patients? And, you know, I, I would say one thing that we don't want to do is obviously reinvent the wheel, and we want to use good programs and materials that are already out there. And one of the important um, aspects of the multi-payer approach in everything that we do at the business group is around some kind of standardization. And, and I'm talking about this without having yet had our first meeting with the five payers in the health system, but anywhere where we can standardize um, and, and use existing information is going to be where we are going to focus effort. I mean, I think that what providers experience, whether it's readmissions or, or any other health issue, is that they get that all the plans are doing different things, whether it's they're paying differently, they're rewarding differently, they're measuring differently, they're using a different program. You know, part of what the business group tries to do in its multi-payer activity is to get the plans aligned um, in moving in the same direction. And that's what we would hope to do when, in this project when we meet with the plans and the health systems. So we don't, the answer is I don't know, but I think that, again, we would look to use what's out there that's best in class and that is, can be standardized. And in terms of when we expect pilots to begin, um, we are having our first initial meeting in May with five payers and one health system, and I would suspect if there's enough you know, uh, for us to move forward, which you think we will, it would probably be most likely in the summer or the fall that we would begin the process of piloting. Anything you want to add no. about that, Jeremy? Totally agree. We're not going to reinvent the wheel. There's been tremendous work done over the last three or four years on risk stratification, risk measurement scales. What we're going to try to do is blend the, bo blend the best of both because traditionally one set of those risk assessment tools are based on claim data and another set of those tools are based on uh, EHR derived or clinical data and it's pretty clear that we can increase the precision and specificity of the risk assessment by blending those two approaches and that's what we intend to do. Did you peek at the next question? I did. Okay. So <laughs> the next question is, is access to member-specific clinical information with an EMR by their payer being considered as a means to the end of meaningful, efficient data sharing between provider and payer? And that's what you were alluding to. Right. And so, you know, this interesting question has been going on for a while, which is what, what's the legitimate access uh, anticipation of a health plan to uh, personalized health information, uh, protected under HIPAA and so on, of the member. And under the HIPAA Act, um, access to information um, is really uh, dependent on the use of that information. And if the purpose of that is to manage the care, then it goes under a different category of HIPAA consideration than if it's administrative or paying the bill. And so um, I think what this opens the door to is a, 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 a much more collaborative opportunity to view the health plans and the health systems as working together in the coordinated care management of the patient. And within that 
um, framework architecture, which obviously requires some pretty clear um, definition and governance. I think then the pooling of everything known about the patient towards the best um, care that can be coordinated is appropriate and legitimate. That said, obviously safeguards need to be in place to protect the privacy and confidentiality characteristics of that data. And so that will need to be considered as we imagine data management strategies going forward. So we've reached the end of the submitted questions. Um, does anybody have any burning questions they want to send over to us and type in? Or even if they're not burning. <laughs> any questions? Did they Michelle, was there anything that you wanted to add to anything that um, Jeremy and I responded to? No, I think he covered it all. I'm just, uh, again, you know, it, having been involved in this program since the beginning, it's just nice to see how far it's come, and then I really uh, look forward to what's, ha what's coming in the future, though. Great. So, well, with that, um, any, we thank you all for joining us. And um, I think we are, we're very excited about the next phase of this, which is actually going to be, um, as, we, you know, as we've been talking about, you know, bringing together a health system with, you know, five of our commercial payers in the downstate New York region. And so stay tuned. I think we're going to have something great to share. I think um, this kind of activity, I don't think that I know of it's being done anywhere else in qu quite this way. So, um, so, you know, stay tuned for, you know, where this leads us. And, um, and I'm going to turn it back to Jeremy for any closing remarks as well. Yeah, thanks, Laurel. So I just want to say, um, having reviewed the attendee list of this webinar, and um, kind of we have had almost no dropout since we started, which you always look for if you're on a webinar to make sure you're not boring the, uh, the participants. I have to say that the diversity of stakeholders represented on this call represents the diversity of stakeholders on the slide we showed with the 62 participants. And I am absolutely confident that the path forward to find the best solutions, not just for readmission reduction, but for collaborative high-value care will be a multi-stakeholder process. So um, whether you're a health plan, a health systems, a supplier, an IT company, a digital health company, a consultant, I'm like trying to look at who else is here. Uh, um, we, we would love to get your um, input and feedback at any point. Uh, all of you will have access to these slides. Um, I think when we show the next slide, you'll see that part of it is you have access to not just the slides, uh, but to us. And so please don't be shy about sending us emails. If you're involved in some project that touches on this, we'd love to know about it. If you've heard about a key project, we'd love to know about it. If you want to be involved in this project, we'd like to know about it. So um, one of our main roles here at the business group is to be an active um, hub of coordination and communication. So please feel free to participate in that in any way that uh, you're interested in doing. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Randy from MCOL, who just has some closing remarks. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. We would like to thank you, our speakers, and session participants for joining us today. We will be sending a follow-up feedback form at the conclusion of this event and would appreciate it if you fill it out. If you haven't already, be sure to join our LinkedIn group on the web where you can post questions, start discussions, and suggest topics for future events. This now concludes our webinar.